Hello, I'm hematologist oncologist Dr. Tony Talibi, and we're back with Dr. Kaya Rosha Lima, co director of phase one colorectal and hepatobiliary program at University of Miami. Now we're going to discuss the treatment of locally advanced colon cancer. Dr. Rosha Lima, assuming that a patient has had a biopsy for colon cancer, they've already had a workup which does not show any spread anywhere else in the body, and they have had the colon cancer resected. They come to you. What happens next? Well, uh, good afternoon. The, prob probably the most important information at that point is to understand the stage of the patient. If the patient has a stage one tumor, um, meaning that the tumor does not uh, invade uh, through the muscle uh, and does not involve uh, lymph nodes, then uh, those patients that have stage 1A or 1D, and those patients should just be uh, followed without any additional therapy. For patients of stage 2 colon cancer, and uh, those patients are either G3 or G4, depending on how deep the invasion, and either if there is uh, extension of the tumor into surrounding organs or into the peritoneum, uh, then those patients may be considered for additional therapy after surgery. For those patients, it's a, um, controversial, controversial um, the extent of benefit of uh, chemotherapy at that point. We feel that for patients for stage um, 2B, for patients with T4 lesions, even without lymph node involvement, the data are more compelling to justify adjuvant chemotherapy. For patients with a T3 tumor, negative lymph nodes, if the sample size of lymph node is adequate and the suggested minimum is 12 based on mm -hmm. ASCO guidelines, mm -hmm. one uh, would have to have a long discussion with the patient about the pros and cons. The only prospective randomized uh, clinical trial that uh, uh, suggests a benefit to chemotherapy uh, compared to uh, best uh, supportive care was uh, uh, published in the Lancet uh, journal and shows a um, benefit in overall survival and five-year survival. Five-year survival was uh, you know, around less than 5% uh, taking all comers. So it's very debatable because of the, you know, the specific population of low margin of uh, benefit. Mm -hmm. Should the patient require chemotherapy, what do you suggest with chemotherapy regimen? For a stage 3 patients, um, the answer is easier. For stage 3 patients, one would uh, consider Fofox um, based on, as the standard of care. This is based on uh, the Mosaic adjuvant trial as reported in the New England Journal of Medicine, showing a benefit in median, uh, and now we have updated data. Uh, at six year uh, survival. However, this is associated with toxicity and uh, one particular toxicity may be uh, long lasting and in a minority of patients uh, could be not completely reversible and that is peripheral neuropathy. Mm -hmm. It's a sensation of tingling and numbing in the hands and feet that may be um, impair, that may impair function, including the ability to type in the computer, to pattern your clothes, to you know, correctly uh, use utensils, um, filling the gas pedal when you're driving, walking, and so forth. So it's, uh, it's, it's, it's a type of, of a situation that you have to have a good discussion mm -hmm. with the patient. Mm -hmm. And I can give an example, you know, for a pianist, you know, for, or for someone that, uh, you know, plays an instrument and is a professional. This type of toxicity may impair their long-term career or career goals. So that uh, benefit of the addition of oxaliplatin to what was the old standard for a few uh, may be questioned. So mm -hmm. it's not one, uh, one treatment fits all. This has been according to the goals and uh, the expectations from, from the patient. And this is for stage three disease. And more recently, there has been a meta-analysis that even challenge this recommendation of Fofox mm -hmm. for patients with stage three disease if they are older or equal to 70 years old. So that, in that population, the use of 5-FU-based therapy was uh, 
sufficient and less toxic mm -hmm. uh, than faux fox. Uh, so one may, you know, use that information to even fine tune their adjuvant treatment in the patient that are seven years older. What about for stage two? Do you ever treat stage two non lymphose positive? As we discussed in the previous module, if you watch that, um, the stage two patients is um, a variety of uh, subtypes. I tend to be more aggressive in recommending adjuvant chemotherapy for patients that are stage 2B, meaning that they have T4 lesions, what means that the tumor goes um, uh, beyond the uh, colon, either into an adjacent structure or into the peritoneum. Uh, when the patient is not adequately staged, there are not enough lymph nodes. And the minimal number that is acceptable by ASCO guideline is 12. So in someone with less than 12 lymph nodes, one would be um, more uh, inclined to recommend adjuvant chemotherapy. In someone that has a poorly differentiated tumor, or someone that has a, a, a persistent elevation of CA, although this is not part of the high risk uh, it has been reported in retrospective analysis that persistent elevation CA is a bad prognostic factor. Mm -hmm. Now, if you have the patients that have a T3N0, meaning that the tumor is confined to the column but goes through the entire muscle of the column into the pericolonic tissue but does not break that pericolonic tissue in the adjacent organ or into the peritoneum, and you have 12 or more lymph nodes and all negative for cancer. The tumor is well differentiated. There are no lymphovascular invasion. The CEA postoperatively is normal. Mm -hmm. Then uh, the, the recommendation of chemotherapy is a challenge. It doesn't mean I'm not going to recommend. So uh, one could suggest um, in that setting uh, frank discussion of the patient that uh, if the benefit of adjuvant chemotherapy exists, it's low in a quote in the previous module, a um, uh, Great Britain uh, uh, adjuvant trial published in the Lancet, there was a randomizer sh showing a small but uh, statistically significant benefit in five years, favoring 5-FU basic chemotherapy uh, to no therapy. If treatment is given, I would favor the use of a fluoropyrimidine alone, I wouldn't use Fofox. And in that situation, I would order microsatellite instability test. Mm -hmm. If the patient tests microsatellite instability positive by immunohistochemistry, or microsatellite instability high by PCR analysis, then those patients tend to have a better prognosis. Mm -hmm. and the use of either few does not improve the outcome. Now, if they are microsatellite is stable, called MSS, by immunohistochemistry, or if they tested by PCR, microsatellite MSI low, then uh, uh, I would then uh, consider the use of a fluoroperimidine in the adjuvant setting. Yeah. There is uh, also a tool that uh, used by some physicians uh, based upon uh, retrospective analysis called Oncotype GX that, mm -hmm. in my opinion, has been better validated in breast cancer mm -hmm. today, but is another option that one may utilize. If you have a patient with um, a microsatellite uh, instability that uh, you would not already recommend, uh, five of you, then you would then look into the uh, possibility of using oncotype GX mm -hmm. to separate the set of genes that would predict for a higher high against the set of genes that would predict um, to a low uh, recurrence rate. I see. What are your recommendations in terms of diet and exercise while receiving adjuvant chemotherapy? Um, diet, again, um, the usual rule, low fat. Um, regarding the use of uh, uh, vegetables and fruits that is generally a recommendation, keeping in mind that chemotherapy may cause neutropenia, so uh, one should be careful about uh, the use of vegetables, and um, I, I generally tell my patients that at least in the beginning, that you understand if they 
will have difficulties with neutropenia or not, they should stay away from vegetables since they can be uh, seeded with mm -hmm. uh, bacteria and that could be an issue uh, for infection in, in these patients. And neutropenia is a low white blood cell count for our patients that uh, don't know the terminology. What about patients that would like to work? Is it possible to work while undergoing Volpoc, which is every two weeks of chemotherapy? Most of the patients in my clinic are not on disability, and they work through uh, treatment. They actually type time the Volpoc on a Friday because they can come to the um, uh, treatment unit and uh, start the treatment. Volpoc is a three-day deal. You know, you, patient comes to clinic, receive the 5 few in a bolus format, you know, in about 15 to 30 minutes. The oxaliplatin and leucovoidin are given in parallel over two hours. And then they go home with the 5 few pump over 46 hours. So they come on a Friday, generally in the afternoon, they, that, that treatment, they spend the weekend with the pump. They come on Sunday to the treatment unit, they disconnect the pump, and they don't even like to you know, lose any other day in the week to be able to receive the chemotherapy and they work full time. Most yes. of my patients are like that. Occasionally we have patients that have difficult side effects and uh, then they need to be on temporary disability for receiving treatment. I see. What about for younger patients who are interested in having children in the future? What are your recommendations in terms of fertility preservation? I, it's a very difficult uh, question to answer. This is not a chemotherapy that is generally associated with uh, um, with uh, risk of infertility to males, and um, um, this perm banking is controversial. Although, if I have a young male patient, I re I generally recommend them to um, uh, bank the sperm just in case. Mm -hmm. But uh, the sperm counts uh, after full fox tend not to be affected over time, and the risk of um, malformation or congenital abnormalities and so forth. Uh, uh, if the patient, while on chemotherapy, follows our recommendation of uh, a contraception, because although um, it's less likely can happen, you know, if one, one can get pregnant during chemotherapy. So doing the treatment, there is a risk of malformation, and we basically recommend that the, the patient needs to be on effective method of, contra of contraception, uh, male or female. But after the treatment is completed, um, a few months afterwards, there is no exact number to give you, the uh, male sperm count comes up to normal and the chance of having uh, fetal abnormality as an associate with a previous exposure to full fox is very little. Mm -hmm. Now, um, and if the patient, you know, bank their sperm, they can consider using that as their um, method for um, pregnancy. Mm -hmm. Now, for females, uh, things are a little bit more difficult. First of all, contraception is mandatory. You need to be you know, high on treatment on an uh, effective method of uh, contraception. Or if you happen to be receiving chemotherapy after delivering a baby, you cannot breastfeed, period. Mm -hmm. Now, after the treatment is completed, then you know there is still a risk of fetus malformation uh, in women mm -hmm. because you know the women are born with the number of ovules they're going to uh, generate. They may not be become uh, incapacitated of generating uh, or uh, being fertilized, but there is uh, uh, a conceived risk of uh, malformation afterwards. Mm -hmm because of the previous exposure to chemotherapy. So um, we generally recommend that uh, women that still plan to have children after chemotherapy to visit uh, our genetic group so they can uh, look at, you know, in ways to uh, preserve prior to treatment uh, the others as well. I see. And what about, I understand that you recommend contraception, but is it okay for patients to have sexual relations with their partners while receiving chemotherapy? With a very good and approved contraceptive method. Okay. What about menstruation? When does that happen? What happens with menstruation and, and menses during chemotherapy? With Fofox, is not a major issue. Um, you know, even stress can uh, lead to changes in uh, the periods and menses and either the duration or frequency. 
but it's a common to observe um, menopause I see. during treatment. And hair loss is a very important issue, especially to women. Do they lose their hair while receiving full pox? Unlikely. Okay. If the hair is lost, it's uh, not severe for the most. It's mm -hmm. mild to moderate hair loss. It's possible to have severe hair loss, but not likely. Mm -hmm. How do you deal with depression with patients undergoing chemotherapy? Um, although antidepressive, uh, antidepressive medications may help, um, the most effective method is basically um, psychotherapy and uh, in, in, in our case here we refer a patient to our Cortella Center and uh, they are followed with a psychotherapist. I see. And what are your recommendations for the spouses and children of patients undergoing chemotherapy? Well, the, the recommendation is to support mm -hmm. uh, their, their spouses and support to their family members. There is always a concern that exposure to um, sweat would be a problem, or to saliva would be a problem. This is not uh, 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 confirmed. Mm -hmm. uh, we caution that the exposure to you know, excrements or urine could be uh, an issue. So if this is the case, although unlikely, but one could, could have a family member that is uh, for them lose the control of the sphincter or um, you know, may have an accident, uh, then we recommend that uh, gloves are used if uh, this type of manipulation is going to be, be done, although there is no clear-cut uh, evidence that this could generate uh, any contamination from chemotherapy mm -hmm. with a sufficient dosing for, for complications. There's also a different uh, treatment called Zalox. Do you ever use that in the curative setting? Well, the AVANT trial, A-V-A-N-T trial, uh, is the trial that has randomized patients to full fox and zolox in the adjuvant setting. To my knowledge, it has not been reported in full for the question of zolox against full fox. Although we have all the reasons to believe, in the word you use it, is to believe that zolox and full fox should be equally equivalent, the final data, to my knowledge, has not yet been reported. And what do you generally tell your patients regarding the odds of cure and the chance of recurrence of a either stage two or stage three colon cancer? Depends on um, the stage. Uh, stage two, as I mentioned, could be 2A or 2B, and stage three could be 3A, 3B, and 3C, and mm -hmm. these have different risks. There is a calculator online that I frequently use. It's called the Mayo Clinic Calculator. The second calculator that I occasionally use called Adjuvant Online. Mm -hmm. All these tools may help to stratify patients according to their risk of group and potential benefits of uh, chemotherapy in every And once your patient has completed six months of chemotherapy treatment, how do you follow them thereafter? Well, NCCN uh, is one of the groups that have come up with guidelines. So this is available online. Um, although this is not really data driven, but rather um, expert opinion. So we, there's a lot of variance throughout the country. One could consider the use of the CEA as a tool to monitor their patients uh, if uh, it was elevated prior to surgery. Mm -hmm. uh, the use of uh, routine scans is debatable, uh, but uh, many suggest because early uh, documentation of a relapse in the liver could still be curative, and there is actually some data that early relapse in the lung could also be potentially curative, although the data in, in the liver are more compelling. The frequency of colonoscopies uh, it depends on the predisposition you, you are in. In general, is once every five years or once every five to ten years. However, if one has microsatellite instability, the rate of conversion from polyp to cancer appears to be quicker mm. than in patients with no microsatellite instability. And it is suggested that those patients should have more frequent colonoscopy than once every five years. Mm. Although there is no straightforward once every one, once a year, once every two years. I mean, I, I think that. Uh, that number is not out there. Sometimes they do it uh, in patients with microsatellite stability once every two years or even once a year. Thank you so much. Thank you for watching. We hope this has been educational for you.